Welcome to the Ayn Rand Fan Club. I'm Scott Schiff, along with William Swig. William, how are you? I'm doing well. How about you? Good. I'm good. Uh, continuing with our uh, legends of Ayn Rand fandom, we are excited to have Robert Bidinato, also known as the Vigilante Author. Uh, Robert is a best-selling self-published author, best known for his justice thrillers featuring the hero uh, Dylan Hunter. He's also an award-winning nonfiction writer and former investigative journalist, and of course, a longtime Ayn Rand fan. Welcome to the show, Robert. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Scott and William. Delighted to meet uh, both of you again on, on uh, this format. Great. Great. Well, uh, I have to start with uh, just um, how I met you or found out about you. It was uh, 24 years ago. It was back in 1997 at the 40th anniversary of Atlas Shrug, put on with Atlas Society and the Cato oh, yeah. Institute. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting with some people at the luncheon, and I, I said, as, as I've been saying uh, <laughs> for a long time, the movement is not growing fast enough. And then uh, the gentleman said, I know who you need to talk to. And he brought me over to your table and introduced <laughs> me. <laughs> we had a nice short and, chat. And so you, you, uh, the person brought you over to my table to introduce you to the reason why the movement isn't growing <laughs> fast enough. Is that the idea? No, he was saying that okay. th this is the person <laughs> that also uh, agrees with you. Okay. And so uh, I, I came home and, and bought some of your tapes. Uh, one I really liked was about how there can be kind of rational rituals, even in a philosophy oh, yeah. of reason that can strengthen our bonds with our values. And I, I've actually even recently heard other objectivists suggesting something similar. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you've gone from being a, a nonfiction writer to, you know, an objectivist to now a, a best selling fiction author. I, uh, you know, just if you would just take us through just maybe your early days, what are some of the things that most shaped you, including, you know, how you got into Ayn Rand? Well, it's a long story, and I'll try to be brief about that because nobody really cares about anybody's biography except the uh, person, uh, the person living it. Um, <laughs> I grew up in um, uh, a dying mill town in Western Pennsylvania. I was a uh, uh, I was a kid who really loved reading. I really loved books, and I was pretty much because of that a loner. I mean, I played with the neighborhood kids. We got in fights, and we played baseball in our yard, and all of that sort of thing. But but my interests were not those of most of the kids around me. Um, my parents were blue collar folks who never really finished their uh, high school educations. Um, and they worked, uh, worked like dogs all their lives. And uh, I, because of my, I guess, self-imposed isolation, I went into books a lot. I watched a lot of TV. I was heavily influenced by 1950s TV heroes and comic books. Uh, okay. And I've written about that. Um, I really loved the, you might say, lone wolf vigilante type characters, the Lone Ranger, Zorro, Batman. Uh, these were icons to me. Um, and I just, I just uh, gobbled up all of those TV shows. I also like Superman. But the one thing that I really didn't like about Superman is I couldn't relate to anybody with superpowers. I liked the Lone Ranger and Zorro and Batman because they were, you might say, super people, super men, but they weren't, uh, you know, they didn't have powers and abilities beyond those of mortal men as Superman did. They were people who, if you shot them, they would bleed, uh, they could get hurt. Uh, they were just extraordinary. And, um, the real thing that committed me to these kinds of characters and a couple of core premises that really I've taken through all of my life and I've never really gotten rid of or strayed from um, the metaphysics, you might say, of what I describe as heroic individualism. They were the embodiment of heroic individualism. 
And the second thing is the morality of justice. Uh, these characters were all about justice. And those two themes, heroic individualism and justice, I took very seriously then, and I still do. Um, now, when I was a kid, uh, because I was a reader, I had a couple of accidental influences in my life that uh, took me on the route to an interest in ideas. Uh, there were two teachers in my um, uh, elementary and junior high uh, who had a big effect on me. They were political conservatives and anti-communists, and they, they were really into those kinds of topics. They could still um, work in schools back then. Yeah, that, they could still work in schools and actually teach American history. Uh, I had a very a, a guy by the name of Bob Gardner, who was a hi history teacher. Um, and uh, Bob was a, an alumnus of Grove City College, and he studied under Hans Senholtz and Clarence Carson, uh, who were at that time, uh, the, the Grove City College uh, was a conservative Christian college before um, Hillsdale College came along. And it, everybody these days knows about Hillsdale and their teach right, traditional right. Uh, constitutional history and all of that. Uh, Grove City was like that back then. Hans Senholtz, the uh, economics professor, had studied under Ludwig von Mises. He was one of those uh, students of Mises like uh, George Reisman and Murray Rothbard later on. And he taught at Grove City. And it was one of the few places in the country that was teaching um, free market economics. And Grove City was just about oh, 20 miles from where I lived. So it was right up the road. And Bob Gardner studied history there under another conservative by the name of Clarence Car uh, Carson, um, author of a lot of books that the Foundation for Economic Education put out. And so these two teachers that I had at, at, Gross, or at um, uh, Union High School in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, um, they would sort of bring some of that stuff into the classroom. And I became really interested in it. And then a second influence there was there was a little old lady librarian at our school library um, who was a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution. And she was also a member of the conservative book club. And so she would get all of these books from the conservative book club at the time. This is in the 1950s and 60s. And she would bring them into the school library. Now, what kind of elementary school library would have <laughs> human action by von Mises? Um, I, I mean, uh, these kinds of things were, were all over the shelves in, in our school library. So it was an easy transition for me to go from the classroom and listening to uh, Bob Gardner and uh, the art teacher who would bring in little pamphlets and things to uh, going to the school library and uh, taking out books on these subjects. So I became a very weird kid who had a voracious interest in politics when I was about 12 and 13 years old. Um, but it did teach me one important thing and that was how to think in principles. Um, I learned about individual rights and free markets and limited government. And I learned about them as a justice issue. Uh, I became enamored of uh, a little later on of uh, Frederick Bastiat, the sure. 19th century, the yeah, a 19th century French economist. Uh, I loved the law. I loved those things. And, and many of those were being published by um, uh, the Foundation for Economic Education, which was about the only free market think tank out there during that period of time. This was before the launch of the libertarian movement in the late 1960s. So I got all of this sort of thing as a, I was, I was raised as a Catholic kid and I encountered all of this literature and I had this fundamental commitment to heroic individualism and all of these childhood heroes and to justice. Um, and I already had the free market and uh, <laughs> limited government uh, perspective. And it was later that I encountered Ayn Rand. That was, uh, that was late in my high school career that I encountered her when I got involved in certain activist things 
Uh, and I also loved writing. I got involved in writing essays uh, at school about political subjects. And I started submitting letters to the editor, to the local uh, yeah, newspaper. Yeah. And um, you know, so I became really fanatical about all of that sort of thing. I won the American Legion essay con contest for the county and the district, uh, uh, one of my essays. And uh, then I, one of my teachers got me a, a subscription to the Freeman magazine. And, I, you know, so I was yeah, off yeah. and running when I was a kid. Um, needless to say, uh, I didn't have much of a social life. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, but it sort of set things up for where, where. Uh, that can I even happen them. to the uh, socialist bookish. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So yeah, I you know where other people were were um, what do they call them the uh, red diaper babies? Right. Uh, I don't know what I, you would call me, but I was I was sort of set up uh, throughout my early and uh, mid teens uh, for when Ayn Rand came along, and that was about uh, you know I was in the mid sixties, and um, Atlas Shrugged had already been published in nineteen fifty seven, of course, and. And this was not long afterwards, and uh, the Nathaniel Brandon Institute was going strong and uh, was, was, a, was a real thing at that point. And um, so what happened is in high school, uh, I read The Fountainhead, and I was very troubled by it. It was, uh, it was one of the books in our school library, thanks to our little DAR librarian. And... I read it. I was very troubled by it. And I remember turning around to a girl named smartest girl in the school. She was sitting behind me one day and I was reading the fountainhead and I had it on my desk and I turned around to her and I said, have you read this book, the fountainhead? And she said, Oh yeah, I love it. And I said, well, I don't, I'm having real trouble with this woman's with this woman's atheism you know, uh, because I was very devout Catholic sure. at the time. And uh, so Jackie um, and, and I talked a little bit and, and I don't recall having finished The Fountainhead at that time. Um, later on uh, in my uh, senior year, after I had gotten politically active in Young Americans for Freedom, and I was communicating with lots of other people, including people who called themselves objectivists in, the, in that uh, political youth group, um, I uh, read We the Living, and I, I was knocked out by the book. I was already a really firm anti-communist, and when I read We the Living, it just bowled me over. Sure. So, so I had read essentially one and a half books by Ayn Rand, and um, something really interesting happened that had a pivotal influence on me. Um, uh, my Young Americans for Freedom activism uh, and my troubles with, with Rand's atheism. Um, in 1967, there was a Pittsburgh National Convention of Young Americans for Freedom. And I went there because it was nearby, had a glorious time. But I saw all these people wandering around with uh, badges and bumper stickers that said, who is John Galt? <laughs> and I had no idea who John Galt was, uh, but there was one cute little girl there that I, I got sort of interested in. And I was chatting with her and I said, look at all, the what's all this John Galt stuff? Who is John Galt? And this girl looks at me with stars in her eyes. She looks away and says, he's the perfect man. Now, <laughs> When a pretty girl says to you, this guy is the perfect man, you I'll tell you, I had, I, I had to find out who this John Galt character was and why that, you know, this, this character who put these stars in her eyes. So fall of 1967, I enrolled in Grove City College to major in economics under, under Senholtz. And I did the logical thing my freshman year, I went to the bookstore, college bookstore, and there was a cop, there's Atlas Shrugged on the uh, book short, uh, store shelves at Grove City. So I bought the book. I took it. I started leafing through it. It looked really interesting. The, the back teaser copy was really good. I'm sure Rand wrote it. And so I started reading it. And uh, guys, 
the book absolutely destroyed my college career. <laughs> it destroyed my career in economics. I read Atlas Shrugged and it absolutely blew me away. Uh, I'd never read anything like it. I mean, nothing like that had ever been written before. And, but Rand's atheism was still there and it was still a problem for me. So what I did is I tried to go back and reread the book with magic marker highlighters. And I was, you know, making marginal notes. I read it critically the second time. Meanwhile, all of my courses are getting the short shrift. You know, I'm not paying attention to any of my- Yeah, it's a long book. <laughs> any of my classes. And I'm, uh, and I'm talking to my friends around me. During that period of time, and one other thing, we had one of the absolutely best classes of kids at Grove City that you could imagine. They went on to become economists and political scientists and so forth. And we all hung out together. And we were arguing late night, all of our philosophical differences and so on. And so we were, we would be trading things. We had Rothbardians and we had uh, um, people who were interested in uh, uh, Robert Lefebvre, who was another anarchist. We had people who were interested in uh, straight uh, uh, Austrian economics. So we we're all arguing back and forth about everything. We had some, a couple of people who were interested in RAN, um, but uh, brilliant, brilliant kids. And I learned so much from them in those late night arguments. And um, so, so uh, YAF had a big split in 1969. Uh, out at St. Louis at a convention out in St. Louis. And I went there and I argued with, um, I remember arguing with Carl Hess under the St. Louis arch. Um, uh, we just had a grand time. I, I, and I had a period of flirting with anarchism right around then and, uh, and the libertarian movement that it really got launched at that 1969 YAF split. And, um, and so I was involved in all of that. And that, that sort of sets up where I finally wound up, which was post-college getting involved with uh, the objectivist movement and and uh, writing and trying to figure out Rand? what was. Pardon? Did you ever meet Rand? Yes. A couple of Ford Hall forums. Um, she spoke at the Ford Hall forum in Boston. After college, I moved to Boston and um, I was struggling for a good while trying to figure out how somebody with my views could write and publish where I could write and publish and <laughs> because I really wanted to write. Um, I had to do a stint in the Army Reserves and basic training around 1971. But I was, uh, I would go to these Fort Hall Forum things, met some wonderful, wonderful people from Canada and all over the United States and foreign countries that would come to uh, make their annual pilgrimage to hear Rand speak. And so on a couple of occasions, I was there. I got some autographs of her. She autographed my copy of the uh, uh, collected um, objectivist newsletters. And, um, but it was just in passing. But I heard her speak. She was really, truly a singular person. Uh, that low um, alto voice, thick Russian accent. And um, uh, it was quite, it, she was short. She was small and stout at the time, but she really left an impression and a brilliant. I mean, she was during the Q&A periods. You did not cross her during Q&A. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's legendary, but I was there. I saw that thing and, and I felt sorry at times because I think at times she misunderstood the intentions of some of the right. questioners. And she she would just rip them, and it was uh, it was something to see. But um, uh, she she was uh, she was a, like a singular human being, and deserving of all of the acclaim and attention that she has gotten over the years. Okay, well, I want to flash forward a little bit. The uh, you know she she died in 1982. The <laughs> Ayn Rand Institute started in 1985. You were you were around the objectivist movement. Uh, I think, uh, like David Kelly, you weren't officially with them, but maybe you you uh, wrote for early objectivist newsletters on principle. 
Yeah, On Principle, which is an independent one that turned into Oasis Magazine, wherein lies a tale that I'll get into in a minute. <laughs> but I also wrote for The Intellectual Activist, which was being published at the time and, uh, and uh, edited by uh, Peter Schwartz. Right. And Peter Schwartz was, of course, um, uh, very close with uh, Leonard Peikoff, and um, uh, he was also an officer, I think, a chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute when it got set up. And so during that period of time, I was writing and I wrote uh, three long pieces that were published by the intellectual activists that got quite a bit of attention. Um, one of them uh, about the Bhopal, India uh, chemical disaster. I remember that Union Carbide. Uh, the Union Carbide disaster. And I, I wrote this piece for him based on reporting by the New York Times and elsewhere that showed that it was really government industrial policy in India that was responsible for, the, for every step of that disaster and how it occurred. And I wrote this piece for the intellectual activist. And um, I think it was one of the guys, I don't wanna mention a name because I'm not entirely sure it was him, but one of the fellows who was an op-ed editor at the Wall Street Journal loved the piece and excerpted it on the uh, editorial page of the Wall Street Journal. Um, another one, I wrote the first piece um, investigative kind of piece on the animal rights movement that had ever been written. And um, later on, after that was published, uh, Edwin Locke, uh, who was uh, affiliated with ARI, right. he loved it. And he, he contacted me, I think by email or mail, I can't remember which, and asked me how I found out about all this stuff. And that became sort of a hobby horse of his later on. He started writing a lot about the animal rights movement uh, later on after I wrote this uh, um, seminal piece on the topic. So that was two things. And then the final one, I wrote a piece called Simon Geller Fights the FCC. And this was about a one man radio station owner in uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts, who played nothing but classical music but he fell afoul of FCC content regulations, which said you had to devote a certain proportion of your time, of your broadcast time every day and every hour to public service stuff, which he was not doing. All he would do, this, this, this uh, goofy little guy named Simon Geller, all he would do is in the, his basement apartment with a <laughs> 5,000 watt radio station, he'd just put on recordings of operas and all of that and, and he was beloved in the community so it turned out to be a big first amendment case fought um by i think the capital research center and some other uh, organizations they were fighting uh to keep him on the air when they were trying to get rid of his license people were trying to uh to take his license so i wrote this piece and that brings me forward now to my involvement with Reader's Digest because that piece was spotted by a friend of mine, uh, Howard Dickman. Howard Dickman oh, is a, uh, got his doctorate in history, wrote a wonderful study of the history of the labor movement in the United States called Industrial Democracy in America. And Howard was an editor at Reader's Digest. Uh, and he spotted my piece and uh, we met at a party for Oasis magazine at the publisher's place of a fellow by the name of Michael Berger, who was an objectivist uh, in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, Howard and I met there and we hit it off really well. And this was in, like in 1986. And he had read my article and we and he said, well, we ought to talk about you contributing something to Reader's Digest. And so we went back and forth for a while. And he finally said, you know, that Simon Geller piece you wrote, you'd have to make it a personal thing, but maybe we could turn that into something for Reader's Digest. So what I did is I took, um, I took that to heart and uh, he and I worked on a proposal and it was accepted in 1987. And I started, that was my first article in uh, Reader's Digest was titled The Invincible Voice of Cape Ann. And I think it was in the October 1987 issue. And 
that launched me with Reader's Digest. It was well received. Uh, didn't you know? Wasn't a grand slam home run, but it, it was well received, and and it told the story of this guy's fight against the FCC. And so there's my justice theme, from childhood coming back in again. <laughs> That's you know? where it came in. Now, I I went to your Wikipedia page, which has some great info, and I, I saw the stuff about Reader's Digest. It turned out that you played a huge role in exposing uh, Willie Horton and the soft on crime policies of Massachusetts and Governor Dukakis yes. during the 88 election at a time when he had like a 24 point lead or something, he ends up losing. <laughs> um, right. That's, that story is like, like the, almost the next step with this Reader's Digest thing. Um, I am writing now I had my first piece in 1987 in Reader's Digest around October right around that time I'm still writing regularly for this little objectivist magazine called Oasis magazine now long defunct and um, uh, in November the Associated Press had this article about this controversy that was going on in Massachusetts about their furlough program uh, they were furloughing uh, murderers who had been sentenced to life without the possibility of parole to weekend passes from prison, which everybody thought was crazy. What in the world's going on here? And so I read this article and and uh, they uh, some one of the editors at Oasis magazine passed it along to me and says, you know, this looks like a story. Dukakis is uh, going to be one of the candidates on the Democratic side running for president, and it's, this has become a big controversy up in Massachusetts. Uh, why don't you see if you can find out some stuff? So I called up a couple of prosecutors and some people up there in Massachusetts, got the story, and I drafted an article for Oasis magazine. And then one of the serendipities of my life, which always seemed to happen when I really I'm on the ropes, need money or whatever. The, uh, uh, Oasis magazine, the publisher said, this is not taking off the way I wanted to. And I'm going to have to close down at the end of the year here. So I have this article that was going to go in Oasis magazine about the Massachusetts prison furlough problem and a controversy up there. And um now I don't have a place to write for anymore, and they're not going to publish this 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 article. So in desperation, I called up Howard Dickman at Reader's Digest, said, "Is this something you guys would be interested in?" And I I sent him the copy of the thing. He read it, and we talked about it. And Howard, you know, he understood you know the liberal democratic politics as I did, and uh, he wasn't a fan as I wasn't. Uh, he was an objectivist too, and so Howard said. Well, we would have to send you up to Massachusetts again. You've just been up there for the uh, Simon Geller piece. Uh, we'd have to send you up there and you can interview all the people involved and uh, we'll put together a proposal for the digest. And so at the end of 1987, before Michael Dukakis, he was one of the seven or eight different candidates on the right, Democratic side. Contested. Yes, he, he, it was a heavily contested. Even Al Gore was one of the candidates. They had a whole bunch of them. And there was a Pat Schroeder, Senator Pat Schroeder. Uh, we referred to him as, uh, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Um, <laughs> um, but they had a whole bunch of Democratic candidates. So there was no way at that time that, that I or Reader's Digest could possibly know what was going to happen. So I get the okay to go up, uh, uh, to go ahead and prepare this article for Reader's Digest. And that happened like in January of 1988. It took me three months of, on, of research, interviewing people, interviewing crime victims up there, um, uh, parents of murdered children, uh, the prosecutors of uh, Horton, the, the Horton story, which I don't even want to go into at, the, at this point because it's just too long to explain. Right. But the, he was a guy who was let out on one of these furloughs that the governor, what the governor was doing, um, Mike Dukakis, who was then governor of Massachusetts, had been using these guys furloughs. These were life without parole murderers, first degree murderers sentenced to life without parole. And what he was doing, 
he was putting those guys into this furlough program on weekends. And it was a kind of a trial and error thing. If they came back after their weekend furloughs and there was no evidence that they killed anybody or you know knocked off a liquor store or anything like that, if uh, after 10 years in the slammer for first degree murder, there was no death penalty in Massachusetts. So life without parole was the worst you could get. What do caucus would do these guys would then, he would commute their sentence down to life with the possibility of parole, to second degree murder. Mm. At that point, these guys would go on a track to become um, eventually to return to society. Now, these are the worst of the worst in Massachusetts. These were guys that the judges, the juries, and the legislature had never intended to ever get out. And so, it hit the fan when one of these guys, a guy named William Horton Jr., um, uh, he was one of many of these guys that actually committed crimes when he was out. He, is, he didn't come back from his uh, 10th furlough. He went down to Maryland. He attacked a couple in a Maryland home. He was captured by the police in a shootout and car chase. And that hit... Uh, hit the newspapers in Massachusetts and caused Dukakis a great deal of problem because everybody was saying, what in the world is going on with this furlough program? And it was a huge front page controversy. So as I'm writing this article between January of 1988 and March of 88, suddenly Michael Dukakis has become the Democratic front runner. I submitted my article at the end of March, 1988. One of the newspapers in Massachusetts that had been on this story heavily, the Lawrence Eagle Tribune, won the Pulitzer Prize for their coverage. And I had been talking to their reporters and interviewing them and uh, getting all of their material and so on. And when I submitted this article in, to, in March to the Reader's Digest editors, there was absolute bedlam in uh, Chappaqua, New York, where Reader's Digest is headquartered, <laughs> because they knew they had a huge hot potato here. And so they flew me in. They sat me down at a, uh, in the office of the uh, editor in chief. There was a, I felt like um, if you've ever seen the movie, A Man for All Seasons, um, sure. um, if you remember the uh, scene at the end uh, where uh, Thomas More is in the middle, surrounded by everybody there who are asking him questions and he's being interrogated. It was a scene something like that, only friendly. The editor in chief had his glasses, the eyeglasses perched on the end of his nose and he's looking across um, um, a desk that was so big that you could have, you know, could have served as an air, uh, aircraft carrier and landed jets on it. <laughs> and there's this priceless impressionistic art all over the walls and, and so forth. And I'm surrounded by my sponsoring editor, Howard Dickman, plus a bunch of others, other editors there. Is, and, is the staff uh, liberal? Uh, pardon? Or is the editorial group liberal or oh maybe? no these guys were all conservatives but they're varying kinds you know they were traditional conservatives for the most part okay. but i had there were a ton of people in that office they they put a lid on this story uh they said we're going to schedule it for the first available issue which is going to be july 1988 and they said i want you to go back to massachusetts try to get an interview with dukakis Try to get uh, you know more documentation. We're going to send one of our fact checkers up there with you, and we're going to try to get everything we possibly can on this because we have to backstop this article. It's going to be huge, and it was when I, when it hit. It came out in the uh, second week of June of 1988. It was the July issue, but the subscribers start getting it early. The talk show lines, the radio talk show lines or started to burn up with people quoting from my article. It told the story of this whole thing in, in multiple dimensions. And it, I have to say, if it was a great piece of writing. I have to say, <laughs> I really 
hit yeah. a home. I hit a, I hit the grand slam in the bottom of the ninth of the seventh game of the world series, you know, uh, it was a walk off home run. It was, it was that well done. And, um, uh, I even had to fight the editors to get the wording to be exactly right the way I wanted it at the end. And, um, and when that hit, um, um, Lee Atwater, who was the right. George H. W. Bush campaign manager, and um, Roger Ailes, who went on to be the godfather of Fox News, Roger Ailes at the time was the media consultant for George Bush's campaign. That was the George Bush Senior. I remember and them putting ads out. They saw that article, and. They, uh, Roger Ailes and their pollster, Dod, uh, Bob Teeter, were holding focus groups to see which kind of issues would really work against Dukakis. <laughs> and the polls, the focus groups, somebody brought up my Reader's Digest article in the focus group, and that's all they wanted to talk about. And this was a focus group of Democrats, and they all turned against Dukakis after, after that focus group. And then... Um, Lee Atwater was at the Brown's Chinese restaurant in Luray, Virginia, uh, over, uh, I think it was a Memorial Day weekend. And uh, a couple, uh, two couples were sitting at a table next to him while he was sitting there with his family. They were taking tours of the caves and so forth. And um, it was a, a mixed race couple. There was a, a black couple and a white couple that were uh, sitting at that table. And the a uh, black guy says, you won't believe what I just read in Reader's Digest. And he starts reciting this, my Reader's Digest article. And, and th they were enraged about it. Now, we were so careful when we published this Reader's Digest article. Um, William Horton Jr. happened to be black. We never ran his photo. We never called him Willie or anything like that. He was William R. Horton Jr. throughout my article. And we never brought up the issue of race or anything of that sort. So Lee Atwater's listening to them and he starts joining in the conversation. And so he calls up Teeter and the pollster and they say, here's our issue. And at that point, as you said, Dukakis is way ahead of George Bush in the polls. Right. He had just come off this convention and he's way ahead. They start hammering him on this furlough issue and um, the Horton thing. It destroyed him. His negatives in the polls in like two weeks tripled. And uh, the Republican Party, the National Republican uh, uh, NRC, National Republican Committee or whatever, they bought two million reprints <laughs> of my article. They put copies of my article on every seat at the Republican convention. Um, they shipped this thing out all far and wide. And all of a sudden, my phone's ringing off the hook. I'm getting invited on Geraldo had his own show at that time. I'm at, on the Geraldo TV show. I'm on uh, uh, radio shows from coast to coast, syndicated radio shows. They're all asking about this article. I'm debating Michael Dukakis's uh, uh, campaign lawyer on, on radio in Los Angeles. Amazing. It was insane. And by the way, at that time, I wasn't able to do any more work and I'm starving to death. You know, I'm, I have a wife and a daughter at the time and, and, and we're not, there's no money coming in. And the digest was very generous. They kept, you know, sort of kept me in chips and <laughs> surviving, but that put me on the map and led to my crime writing crime, later crime books that I wrote about. And my experiences also were the foundation for, my first novel, Hunter, later on, much later on in 2011. Okay, um, and I, I want to get to that. I mean, but I'm just, the. Uh, it, it is funny the way that, I mean, you did have an, 
enough of an impact on the election that by 92, Bill Clinton was running on, you know, getting 100,000 more police officers just yes. to avoid the soft on crime charge. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. The day ever gets afraid of the crime issue because it's pure good versus evil. It's simple justice. Um, it's, you know, treating criminals as if they're really criminals and they're predators rather than um, uh, making excuses for them. And, and uh, so this was something that cut across party lines and demographics. And, uh, and uh, it had just a huge impact on, on, on the country. And it had a huge impact on my own career. Sure. Now, it's interesting because, I mean, just from a timeline, this is, I mean, within months of the whole breakup between uh, Peakoff and Kelly, fact and value, truth and toleration. Right. So then, uh, you know, I mean, I think uh, the, the record of history is clear. You came down on the uh, Kelly side and worked with him. Um, and that's where I met you via, you know, at the... Uh, the Atlas uh, anniversary, right? The Atlas Society. Uh, uh, well, it it had several different names. It's uh, the organization's undergone several different names. It's currently known as the Atlas Society. But uh, right. yeah, back then I, I started doing talks at uh, some of their events back in the early '90s. I did a talk on crime and and crime victims who became dear friends of mine showed up in New York City at the uh, at my talks. Um, there were some some very notable people at that time, I won't drop names, but they, they showed up at some of my talks. I became a, a really good friends with people who headed police organizations and uh, victims' rights organizations, and uh, right. they just loved my stuff, and, uh, and uh, my, my uh, articles in Reader's Digest and my other writing was all very pro-victim and victim-oriented, and of course, like I say, all of that stuff set up what I started writing with my crime thrillers, the Dylan Hunter crime series. Um, that's the same perspectives and the, those events inspired an awful lot of what's in those books. Yeah. I, so, I mean, you've spoken about the, the power of art and shaping one, one's life and the broader culture. And I, I talked with this about Mark, uh, with Mark Pellegrino as well, the fact that, you know, because he's an actor, um, and in a lot of ways, I mean, we see that maybe part of Rand's influence was the, you know, not even just so much the quality of what she was saying about reality, but the art itself in terms yes. of the, the long lasting influence. And I'm, I'm curious just, you know, how that kind of thinking and, and uh, narratives you've talked about, just how yes. that got you to uh, being becoming a fiction writer late in life. Well, it was really interesting. I, I, I was involved with the objectivist movement uh, through uh, uh, the TAS group from the uh, early 90s as a speaker uh, and then on the staff in the mid 90s. And uh, one way or another, I was involved until about 2008 when I, uh, I parted company um, from the organization. I was at that time the editor of uh, the New Individualist magazine that they put out, which was doing very, very well and uh, attracting a fair amount of attention. Um, but I, I left at that time, and, uh, and I had always wanted to write fiction, but I was too scared. Um, I, I had uh, somebody in my life once told me that they didn't think I had, I was too, too much interested in ideas in a, I don't know, didactic kind of way, and they didn't think that I had any art any sense of art in me and they didn't think that I could write that sort of thing but I had always loved thrillers and I had devoured them I was I was reading early Alistair MacLean the guns of Navarone Ice Station Zebra where eagles dare those kinds of things and many many others uh, um, like uh, Ayn Rand loved Mickey Spillane stuff I read all of the Mickey Spillane novels I loved those and so I always wanted to do that and around 2004, I had this idea for a character that later on blossomed into um, the Dylan Hunter character. But what set me off on this was I was looking at philosophy and how people actually, how your character is actually developed. Is it 
explicit ideas that shape your character or is it something else? And in my experience, including decades of experience with objectivists, I found that philosophy seems to be an, an ex post facto influence in their lives, that, that things happen early in their lives that set them up for uh, being sympathetic toward the philosophy of objectivism or any other philosophy for that matter. Um, and I asked myself what shaped them. And I looked at Rand's life herself. If you recall from any of the biographies, she had, when she was a, a little girl, she had encountered this character named Cyrus in a French magazine while she was still a, 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 a little girl in Russia. And she absolutely fell in love with this Cyrus character. And long before Ayn Rand was thinking philosophy or ideas, she had this image of, of this hero character who was, uh, well, you can imagine a Douglas Fairbanks Jr. or Errol Flynn sort of, of uh, adventurer. And she was madly in love with Cyrus and his adventures. And much later on, she wrote in her, uh, I think, perhaps her most underrated and underappreciated essay, uh, The Psychoepistemology of Art. She wrote about the power of art and what it does uh, to people. And I, uh, thinking we we're going to talk about this, I, I went to that essay and I saw that she, she, she said that she talked about um, what art actually does. She says, uh, it, you know, you can talk about moral virtues. She says, but an, an exhaustive philosophical treatise defining moral virtues with a long list of virtues to be practiced will not do it. It won't convey what an ideal man would be like and how he would act. No man can deal with so immense a sum of abstractions. And then she went on to say that, hence the sterile, uninspiring futility of a great many theoretical discussions of ethics and the resentment many people feel towards such discussions, moral principles remain in their minds as floating abstractions. Um, and uh, she said that art is the indispensable medium for the com uh, communication of a moral ideal. And she talks then about how every religion has a mythology, uh, uh, that it's a dramatized concretization of its moral code embodied in the figures of men who are, are its ultimate product. Well, she did this very self-consciously in her literature, but... Ayn Rand did not begin as a philosopher, and she makes that clear in her essays, The Goal of My Writing, and in some of the comments, biographical comments she's made. She started out as a romantic visionary. She was shaped by stories. And what I have found, there's a wonderful book uh, called um, The uh, Storytelling Animal by a fellow <laughs> a professor by the name of Jonathan Gottschall. And he talks about how we are wired for story. And in my own thinking about it, I came to the conclusion that one of the most important elements in why we are wired for story was what it does with, um, you might say, um, causality. I think that we are wired for story because when we are little kids, we are trying to understand the world. We want to know how things work. We want to know why things happen the way they happen. And how do we get that, that first understanding? Other than through direct experience, we are given narratives, stories from our parents, from storybooks, from uh, cartoons, all of these things that tell us about how things work. They tell us about good and evil. They show cause and effect in the world. So I think that what stories actually do for us psychologically, fundamentally, is that they are our route, earliest route to understanding causality. And we never lose that. It's why we all watch TV shows and movies and we, we read novels. We, we need that. It, 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 as Rand points out, it concretizes, condenses, and dramatizes all of these kinds of things in a way that's really easy for our subconscious to process and hold in our, you know, we can hold it in our mind all at once. So 
I really think what we need once a philosophy like objectivism is defined, we don't need to continue parsing it and teaching it and, 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 and you know, uh, arguing about it and who has the right you know, interpretation of it and so forth. I became far more interested in producing stories in producing the kind of art that shaped me when I watched Zorro and the Lone Ranger and read Batman comics as a kid that shaped Ayn Rand when she read about Cyrus um, and that shapes most of us. Uh, and it continues to shape us every time we, we turn on the TV, go to the movies or read novels. And that's, that was the decision which when I left uh, uh, the TAS group in uh, 2008, I had had this long simmering uh, story in my head about this character who was sort of born of the vigilante, uh, you might say the, the, the vigilante pedigree uh, in literature. I had my own take on that. And I decided I was gonna write a story and I would hate myself if I went to my grave having never tried to write fiction. I knew I would hate myself and I had to give it a try. So I threw a Hail Mary pass with this novel, wrote it, self-published it in 2011, just at the, when the self-publishing craze was, was getting underway. Right. And damn, if the book did not take off, it went supernova. Uh, uh, the first novel in the series called Hunter uh, became a bestseller on Amazon. Uh, went to number four on the Amazon uh, Kindle bestseller list. Uh, there were only two people ahead of me. Uh, two of the novels were by a, the uh, woman who wrote the uh, Hunger Games books. So two of the Hunger Games books were ahead of me and one romance writer, both female. So, so for about a, a week's period, I was the alpha male on Kindle, um, which was kind of fun. Um, but uh, it, the, the book went on to sell you know, tens of thousands, and then well over a hundred thousand copies. Um, it uh, became a Wall Street Journal top ten fiction ebook, and I was off and running with a very unexpected career at the age of sixty-two as a fiction writer. <laughs> well, oh, Robert, if I can jump in real quick, uh, I just finished reading your first novel, Hunter, and I think you hit a grand slam again. I think uh, with with your Willie Horton novel or <laughs> Willie Horton story, you hit a grand slam in the nonfiction world. But with Hunter, I think you hit a grand slam in the fiction world. So you've basically conquered both worlds of the writing. Well, genre. thank you so thank you so much. That's uh, that's very generous. I appreciate that. Uh, I uh, the the comments the comments and compliments that I get on my fiction mean mean the most to me when people have a background that they can understand where I'm coming from and why I write what I write and uh, how I do it. Uh, and uh, well, the, and that's, well, that, that means a lot. Well, yes. And I, I give you a compliment freely because I, I also do a lot of writing. I have a sort of kinship with you. As a high school student, I had an excellent English teacher. Uh -huh. He got me into writing poetry, and then I started writing short stories. I've since been focusing on nonfiction stuff, mm -hmm. um, but I kind of get, I have an understanding of what you're doing, I think, and um, I really appreciate how you've been integrating your plot and your theme and even your style. I mean, um, one thing I noticed is the theme of deception. We talk a lot about your, your vigilante right. theme, but... Another theme in your story, you know, your book, Hunter, is deception, where right. the characters are lying to each other. Yep. But also the plot, there's deception in the plot, I think, because the very beginning of the story, it, I thought I was reading a spy thriller. Right. And, and it, it reminded me of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy and the character of Jim Prito. Mm -hmm. And then I realized after that, I know I was reading a vigilante thriller. And so I, I didn't realize this at the beginning. I thought, well, that's, that's a weird like transition. But then I realized later, I think I 
understood what you're doing, you're integrating the, the theme of deception into your plot. So I was wondering if you can talk about, you know, how you integrate the theme in the plot and how you re reconnect a deception to your theme of vigilantism. Oh, well, thank you. That's a, uh, that's a tall order of a topic. I'll try to, I'll try to condense more than I've condensed some of these, the, my other comments here. I'll try to condense down here a little bit. Um, when you start out writing fiction, there's a lot of different ways people can proceed. Uh, one extreme are the people who write um, seat of the pants. They are called pantsers in the, in the business. These are people who get a germ of an idea and then they start scribbling about it and they're typing on their, on their screen and they see where the idea is going to take them. Then there's the people who are super organized. They have to outline everything. Um, uh, I, many writers who, and they're great writers on both extremes and in varying degrees in the middle. Right. I happen to be an OCD outliner type. Um, I, I, I mean, it is, it's really sad to watch me try to put together a story and, and I'm not saying that my way is the right way. It's the only way that I can do these things because my, my subjects, uh, my stories are theme driven. And therefore what I come up with, I come up with a theme, a proposition, um, about, um, that like the theme you might say in Hunter is, in a, it, it's, it's, it comes down in a line of dialogue that uh, uh, one of the characters, uh, uh, the hero character comes up with, and he says, uh, um, all that is, uh, he said that um, uh, Edmund Burke was wrong. It shouldn't be all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. It should be all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is an enabler. That's the theme of Hunter. Um, what I needed was, I needed my hero character who stands for justice. I needed bad guys, but I also needed enablers, people who, who enable the bad guys to get away with what they do and Thank encourage you. them and so forth. So the way I, I do my thing is I, once I have a theme, I try to come up with opposing characters who represent the opposite sides of that theme. And then there are variations of the theme um, that come along, uh, people who are caught in the middle or there are other kinds of variations. And I start thinking about characters who would be logically opposing each other. And then the next trick, of course, is to come up with how do you put these people into a plot in which they are utterly opposed to each other? How do you put them into a plot where they are, there is a clash of their personal values and goals? That's the trick of the plotting. And um, <clears throat> it took me a long time to figure out where I wanted to go with the Hunter character. I, ha I had my character, I knew who he was, but uh, in figuring out the, the opposition uh, there were some minor characters that until I had the minor characters, I did not know how to orchestrate the conflict and make it really zing. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted also, <clears throat> I was very much, um, I, I, I love the movie, the, the Thomas Crown Affair, um, uh, the 1999 version with uh, Pierce Brosnan and Rene Rousseau. Uh, I love that because it's a cat and mouse game between a man and a woman. He's he's a um, art thief, um, a billionaire art thief who does it just for fun. She is an insurance investigator who's out to get the <laughs> art thief, and she knows at the beginning that he's the mouse and she's the cat. He knows at the beginning that she's the cat and he's the mouse, but they fall in love anyway. Well, in my story. I wanted, a, I, I thought I needed an intense personal conflict on the part of my hero. I just didn't want to put him up against bad guys. I wanted this to be, I wanted him to be internally torn. And so I said, the best way to do that, or the most intense kind of a conflict would be a romantic conflict. And I was thinking of the Thomas Crown Affair. And in my book, 
the cat doesn't know she's the cat and he's the mouse. The mouse doesn't know she's the cat. Um, and they, these people meet, they fall in love, and they are people who the reader immediately admires and loves. They love the two characters, but they are the last people on the planet who should fall in love. <laughs> and, and of course, this part of the, the great part of the suspense of the story is what happens when these two wonderful people find out who they really are and what they're really all about? And uh, I needed to come up with some other characters and situations that would put them together in a, in a conflict that would make perfect sense. And until I had um, um, the heroine, Annie Woods, wow. until I had her father, and until I found a couple of intermediary characters, which provided the excuse for Dylan Hunter and Annie Woods to meet each other and get together until I had those intermediary characters, I didn't have a story. Once I had them, those, those subsidiary characters, I had a Eureka experience and I had my plot. I knew how I could, I could craft it. And then after that, it was just uh, writing thriller scenes and having a grand time uh, coming up with, uh, with uh, all of the uh, vigilante episodes and uh, the cat and mouse and uh, the, the, uh, my, um, wonderful uh, good guy cop, uh, Ed Cronin, who's a detective who's on the, uh, hot on the trail of the hero. And he's sort of my Javert character, but uh, he's not a bad guy. He's not a fanatic. He's a, he's a really good guy and a very complicated fellow as, as readers of the whole series would see. But, uh, but this just sort of blossomed and it took me forever to come up with the in initial plot of this. I started with ideas in 2004, put it aside for a long time. In 2008, I went back to it. I did a lot of work in 2008, 2009. And I really, st things started clicking around 2010. And then I was able to just start drafting in 2010 and uh, finish the book in 2011. So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's uh, an amazing explanation of plot construction i have a similar issue with trying to construct my own plots it's just it takes forever and i'm a little <laughs> obsessed about it um, oh, I'm, 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 you're not obsessed you have not <laughs> met obsessed until you've seen what i do here i have notebooks all over the place i have lines and arrows drawing i mean it looks like a you know, tinfoil hat conspiracy theory guy here, you know, um, I had, uh, I have a friend who's a very good novelist came to my uh, office one day and I showed him my notebooks and he just, his eyes widened and he says, I could never write like that. <laughs> he writes out much more seat of the pants and he's a very good novelist, but this is just happens to be my way. So. Well, I'd like to ask you um, about the enablers because in, in your story, <laughs> You have a character, McLean. Yes. Or McLean. And yeah. Well, oh, I call it McLean, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's spelled like uh, I, I got names of from my other fiction hero uh, or fictional heroes and authors that I really like. Stephen Hunter, um, uh, Alistair McLean. So I sort of filched their names uh, to uh, to come up with uh, names of some of my characters, sort of an inside joke. And uh, Kevin or, or Ken McLean, who right, is right. Annie Wood's father, is an enabler. He is. I, I'm glad to talk about him because this brings up something about fiction writing generally. Well, let me let me give you a quote from your novel first to sure. give the context. So Ken McLean is a philanthropist who gives money to his organization to help. Um, rehabilitate criminals right. and um the, your your hero has a problem with this dylan hunter and he's arguing that no you should be giving money to the crime victims and helping them right and um he tries to explain his position about the enablers to uh, another character in the novel i believe it was his his lover annie, yes, annie right he, he says quote they don't real he's talking about the mcleans of the world they don't realize that you can't grant compassion toward bad people without committing injustices against their victims. Compassion without justice is just enabling. Yes. So 
with, with that context, um, can you explain what you mean? Sure. Um, it is the thematic seed pretty late in the novel. I wanted to sum up more explicitly what all of the events were adding up to and the nature of the conflict between uh, Dylan and Annie and Annie's father, who was the enabler in chief <coughs> of the novel. And um, that scene does it. Um, if you are, and it's drawn directly from, you might say, the Randian view of justice. Um, in ju justice to me means holding people responsible for the things they do, for good or ill. <clears throat> we reward the good, we, re we punish the bad. Now we do that because of causality. Justice is, you might say, causality in the social wor world, the social arena. And it is based on the premise of self-responsibility. We have volitional control over our actions. And therefore, we have responsibility for the consequences of our action. And when somebody does harm to somebody else, if you're showing compassion and concern and care for the perpetrator of the harm and of the evil, you're betraying the person who was their victim. You're betraying the person who is on the receiving end. And, and you see this all the time in discussions of uh, criminal justice reform. I saw it throughout my career with Reader's Digest when I was doing these crime articles, these true crime articles and investigations across the country. And I was encountering people all the time, including some real life people who inspired me to write the character of Ken McLean, incidentally. Um, his name, his first name, Ken, is directly drawn from a prominent enabler in the uh, in, in that nonprofit world at that time. He's, I don't think he's active anymore, but he was a guy who was extremely influential in pushing alternatives to incarceration programs in state after state after state so that these really hardened predators would get time off for good behavior or they would be diverted into community programs. Uh, Is anything that would influence Dukakis? Oh, yes. That kind of thing influenced him. I wouldn't say this particular fellow did. He came along later on in the mid '90s, but uh, but Dukakis um, was certainly a, a a accepted that whole viewpoint that he believed that nobody should have a permanent penalty, and nobody, even a murderer, should should suffer a permanent lifelong penalty, and. Uh, so he did not believe in, in not only the death penalty, he didn't believe in life without parole sentencing. He didn't believe in locking people up for life sentences. So these people is, are betraying the, their, the victims of these criminals because these poor victims are the forgotten people. They're reduced in most of the reports that are put out by the states and uh, the federal government. They're reduced to statistics to faceless, abstract statistics. They're the forgotten people. That's, um... Victims on many, many occasions. And I've had you know, meals with them, banquets with them. And the scene that I write in Hunter, one of the scenes where he meets a whole bunch of a victim's rights group in, in, in one victim's home, that is drawn from real life. That is drawn directly from my experience. And when you see the devastation that is wrought on people who are victims of crime or they have lost their children to vicious predators and they have an enormous difficulty moving on and it's compounded exponentially when they know that they are being ignored and forgotten. Their loved one, say the person that uh, was killed, is being ignored and forgotten. And the perpetrator is who's alive and in the public eye is getting all the attention, all the perks, all the programs, all of the rehabilitation efforts. Um, they're, they're not being punished. They're not intended to be punished. They are, uh, they're being 
shielded from the consequences of their actions. Uh, and these are even, I mean, really, really vicious people we're talking about. Um, so that's what I meant by that, that if you're showing compassion for those kinds of people, it's a betrayal of the people who, who suffered, who are forgotten and reduced to faceless statistics in, in these uh, uh, legal system reports and are just shunted aside. They're not permitted to, uh, to testify in many cases in plea bargain deals. They are ignored. Um, you look at the, uh, remember the Weinstein character here? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Harvey Weinstein um, and the Jeffrey Epstein character. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein, he got an incredible deal uh, from the courts and it was engineered behind the backs of all of the crime victims, all of the victims of his sexual predatory uh, behavior. It was engineered without their knowledge, without their input, without their consent, even in violation of the laws that said that they're supposed to be notified, they were supposed to have input. He was given an incredible deal and allowed essentially a work release, quote unquote, program in which he would go to his own office that he op opened for the purpose of the work release. And he would sit around all day. He had women coming in to visit him. He had friends. He would go wherever he wanted to go. It was outrageous that this predator on young girls got that kind of treatment while all of these kids were forgotten and yeah, abandoned. Yeah. Basically, so he was that's what I mean by the, that, the, he is a perfect example of that. And I dramatize that in Hunter. And my hero, Dylan Hunter, is somebody who won't allow that to continue. He won't let that happen. He is a justice character. He's a complicated fellow. But based on his background and so forth, he, he will not. He's on the side of the victims. And he will not allow that to happen. And, and he takes it all very personally. He, his meetings with vic crime victims, he takes their plight, you know, very extremely personally. And that, that theme continues throughout the, uh, the series, throughout the novels. Right. I that... really, really enjoyed Dylan Hunter. Uh, I think he's an amazing character. He's, he's the type of vigilante I would like to see in real life. <laughs> <laughs> he's the kind of he was he's the kind of vigilante guys that I would like to be except that I'm uh, I'm too scared of the consequences and I'm not I'm not I don't have his you might say a special set of skills if I can borrow that from from a, the, the movies uh, out there that take right. <laughs> He's definitely a man of action but let me ask you about his internal struggle, because there is a line in your novel where he says that he's made peace with his mission, you know, uh, hunting yes. down these criminals and giving justice, but he has not made peace with martyrdom. Yes. Can you explain um, what you meant there, like what his, his psychology about that and his struggle with it? Dylan, uh, the, the, uh, there's a, a evolution of, Dev, of Dylan throughout the three novels that I've written so far, and I'm working on more. And in the first, he is trying to come to grips with his new identity. We'll just put it, leave it at that. He's trying to come to grips with who he is. Um, in the second novel, he's trying to come to grips with what he believes is his mission. Um, and in the third, he has decided to fully embrace his mission consciously and uh, sort of turn it into a career. Um, there is a, a slow evolution. In the first novel, Hunter, um, uh, he, is, he is wrestling with the idea. He, does, he, he, could, he could be a guy who just walks off into the sunset with this wonderful girlfriend that he has. His lover, Annie, is, they're sensational people. He could, but he can't walk away when an injustices are committed to people he really cares about. It's just outside of his code. And so he has this struggle. He is a person who loves his life. He's independent. He doesn't want to be a martyr, but he's watching 
bad things happen, not just to good people in the abstract. He's watching bad things happen to people he cares about, people he cares about intimately. And, and nothing is being done about it. Uh, they are being, grave injustices are being committed against them. And they have nobody to defend them. Um, I read um, an essay some years back that might illustrate his psychology pretty well. Um, it was written by a guy who was in the military. And he said, essentially in this essay, uh, which was called On um, Sheep, Wolves, and Sheepdogs. And he said there are essentially three kinds of people in the world. <laughs> There are the sheep who go along, and it's not a bad thing. They're the, the, the normal uh, people in, in the world. They are harmless to other people. They go along. They live productive lives. They live happy lives and so forth. Then there are predators out there. They're the wolves who go out and try to kill the sheep. And the sheep can't defend themselves. The sheep are not, they, they are not capable. They don't have the violence in them. They don't have the skill sets. Um, they don't have the means to protect themselves. So then there are the sheepdogs. And these are the people who refuse to let the wolves win. They're the people who, by their background, by their inclinations, um, by their upbringing, whatever it happens to be, they get involved as police officers, as first responders, as uh, in the military or special forces or whatever, these are people who feel very protective toward the sheep. They want to be the guardians and the protectors of the people who are living their lives and living good, productive lives, but who can't protect themselves. Dylan, for reasons that are made clear in the background of his story, of his story which is revealed in pieces throughout the, uh, this, and also in the uh, future stories, you'll see there are flashback chapters in the future stories that reveal bits and snatches of, the, of the, how he was shaped by his father, by things that happened in his past. And Dylan is a sheepdog. That is who he is. And he cannot stand by when good things are happening to the people around him that he really cares about. And he's going to step in because he has a particular set of skills. He's going to step in and make sure that those people are protected or in some cases avenged for the, the harm that's being done to them. So, so that's uh, essentially it. He does not want to be a martyr, but his thing is he's pro-justice to the point where somebody has to do this. Somebody has to be the cop. Somebody has to be the first responder. And, and so... Would you recall, or would you consider all first responders who have to risk their lives, would you consider those people self-sacrificial in their motives? No. Somebody has to stand up to protect the values that people um, are trying to gain and keep in their lives. And so, so these, these sheepdogs are special people with a special orientation to be the protectors of the civilization that we have and of the people um, who are the good people who make up the civilization that we have in the, in the objectivist uh, world we think of sacrifice as giving up a greater value for a lesser value yes in dylan hunter's case to avoid self-sacrifice what would you say is the the top value that he's trying to save versus the lower value is it his his like just society that he values the most or, or what is it i i think it's internal i think it's his soul the idea uh, that the uh, in this following respect um he couldn't live with himself if he were to he has the motive means and opportunity to do something to protect people he loves and he would sit on his hands and not do it he could not live with himself. It's an issue of his self-esteem. So you might say, rather than self-sacrifice, it's the ultimate in selfishness. He's, he is expressing and fighting for his own self-esteem here. He is a guy who, Dylan Hunter is a character 
who you, know, you can make an analogy, a direct analogy in Atlas Shrugged to the Ragnar Danishgold character, um, because there are certain philosophical and uh, career similarities. Um, uh, Ragnar's course of action does not uh, avoid a lot of risk. He's taking some hefty risks by, by being essentially his own form of vigilante against the uh, system. Um, he could get captured, he could get killed, but he's doing it because of the things he does love and wants to protect. And <clears throat> where he has the means to do that, for him to sit by and not take action would be psychologically impossible. And I think that that's the case with Dylan. Uh, it's a very similar kind of thing. He is a guy who had a background as a guardian, as a protector, um, which I don't want to go into that to spoil any surprises with right. people who are going to read the stories. But <clears throat> it's made clear in, in the course of, of Hunter and of the sequels, Bad Deeds and uh, Winner Takes All, the, the two sequel novels, and it's made clear why it is that he just cannot let these things stand. The idea of allowing people to get away with stuff against people he loves is intolerable. And, and uh, it's a matter of his, since he has the ability to make a difference, for him, it would be an issue of a betrayal of his self-esteem to, to sit by and not take action. That's great. Um, you, uh, you alluded to maybe there's a, there might be future uh, Hunter novels. Yeah, absolutely there are. <clears throat> uh, I am working right now, I was working with a collaborator on uh, doing a screenplay version of Hunter. Um, I think it's the right time in our society and culture and the events that are going on right now to put him up on the big screen. Great. And I, I knowing the way things work in the um, TV and film industry, I wanted to make sure that I didn't just sell the rights to the character and uh, let them do whatever they were going to do with it, which would, would be to vandalize it. Um, I wanted to make sure that what I would sell would be a story that I would craft and I would control down to the little nuances of the style, the style of the characters, the, the way they talk and all of that. I wanted to make sure that it bore the stamp of the original novel. And so I've been working on that uh, in the middle of doing a, a lot of other projects I need to do to, to, to make money, uh, which have been to edit other people's books right now. But <clears throat> I've been working on that. And I've also, I also have a prequel novel for, the, for what has become the Dylan Hunter trilogy. Uh, just to, so that the, your um, audience will know, uh, so far there are three Hunter novels. Uh, Hunter, uh, the second one, Bad Deeds, takes place in the, in the world of environmentalism. And if you have any understanding of uh, objectivism versus environmentalism, <laughs> you can imagine where that novel goes. Um, uh, I'm very proud of, of all three novels. I'm very proud of, uh, of Bad Deeds and how I orchestrated characters who represent, I think, accurately the environmental, the, you know, the spectrum of the environmental movement and how I could arrange uh, such, it, it set it in the background of like the world of fracking, um, um, of um, oh, and, and animal rights and all of these other kinds of things, how I could bring all of those into a nail-biting, exciting thriller. Um, and so I worked that out. It, it's got its own conspiracies in it and everything else. And I think people would love that just as they love the vigilante action and the, um, the wheels within wheels and Hunter. But the third one, Winner Takes All, um, is also about injustice, and it's about what I call the zero-sum narrative. It's a view of life in which you think that one person's gain necessitates another person's sacrifice. The idea that the only way to get ahead is to you view other people as stepping stones and so forth. It's, and, and I wanted to take on that zero-sum narrative and its destructive 
uh, uh, its destructive consequences in people's personal lives, in their careers, in their personal relationships, and in politics. And this was the biggest, most complex, hardest to write novel of all three so far. And it, uh, uh, Scott and William had damn near killed me to write this thing. It was, Goodness. it was a, an enormous effort. It took a long time to put together. And I decided after this one, which has, you know, slam bam action conspiracies all over the place and, uh, and, uh, colorful characters. I decided I had to go simpler for some of the future ones. Uh, and, um, I'm now working on after this, that one, Winner Takes All, the third in the series, I'm working on a new one, a prequel to this whole series called Bad Deeds, or pardon me, called uh, Blind Eye. It's the one that introduces uh, Dylan Hunter as a character in, in when he first gets to Washington, D.C., and uh, some of his encounters with uh, uh, old enemies and so forth. And it's a, it's a simpler story, but it's going to be, I think, every bit as gripping as the others. And then I have other ones lined up. Uh, um, I'm going to be taking on, um, I mentioned Harvey Weinstein and Epstein and all those people. I have a, 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 an outlined novel that I want to write after Blind Eye called Choker, which it gets into that whole world of organized predators mm -hmm. and uh, uh, highly placed predators who are essentially untouchable and it would take a vigilante to touch them. <laughs> so that's one. And, and I also want to deal with the issue in another novel that I I've titled uh, blood brothers. I want to deal with the issue of tribalism, the tribalism that's racking our, our whole society right now left, right, the, the, all of the different manifestations of, of vicious, uh, competitive DNA-based tribalism. I wanted to take that on, and I have, I think, a really good idea for and a developed outline for a story there. And there are some others along the way, but uh, I want to continue to do these uh, Dylan Hunter uh, novels until I drop it's a great, he's a great character. The, the um, side characters, the subsidiary characters in there, uh, Ed Cronin, the, um, uh, the diligent cop, uh, Grant Garrett, the uh, high ranking CIA officer who is, uh, 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 plays a really important role in these stories. Uh, Annie Woods, uh, his lover, uh, uh, I have a I have Dylan's pet cat who's was based on my pet cat Luna. Uh, oh, I love <laughs> Luna. I, I also have a cat, so I really appreciated that because you usually see dogs as the best friends of these vigilantes, but no, in yours it's a cat, and I just really appreciated that. Well, the cat the cat is one of the most popular characters, and then so was another character, sort of his um, um, his nerdy. Uh, a nerdy sidekick, a right. researcher by the name of uh, Fred Frederick Diffendorfer, who goes <laughs> under the nickname everybody calls him Wonk, and uh, Wonk Wonk is one of those characters that he just emerged one day. Uh, I was writing a scene and I needed a, a, a nerdy character, and he just exploded onto the page as his own thing. And I just laughed and laughed and laughed as I was writing his introductory scene in Hunter. Um, he's a very colorful character and just such a fun character. And he continues in the, uh, in the uh, sequel. Uh, so I have this, uh, uh, this group of characters or ongoing continuing characters, and they're all quite different. They're all very colorful in their own way. And, uh, and um, everyone seems, all the readers seem to have their own favorites, but uh, uh, they're, they're going to have, they're going to have lives as long as I do. So <laughs> we're going to continue to do these things. Yeah. So I really enjoyed um, the novel again. I, I'm probably going to have to read it again because there's so much there. I get, you know, after you see a really good movie, you want to watch it over and over to get all the nuances. That's how I felt right. about your novel. Thank you so much. You know, and, uh, one, th one thing I just have to say is I am, 
I, I, one of the negative things I can say about Ayn Rand's influence, completely unintended negative thing. She, she did not intend for this to happen. Her personality and her writing style were so strong that I think she intimidated an awful lot of her fans and readers who would might want to write fiction yeah. um, into thinking that they had to write novels like Atlas Shrugged, where there's speeches and they're highly didactic and they deal with philosophical issues very explicitly. And, and a lot of what I have read from people who are influenced by Rand who try to do fiction is really too heavy handed, too abstract, too preachy, too this and that. And it, and it, and it was not her intention to do that, but everybody who was influenced by her tries to be Ayn Rand. <laughs> and I think that they need to write their own fiction. They need to, to cut loose from that and write their own things. Uh, my influences, Rand is certainly a philosophical influence and uh, her, ro her romance and uh, sense of life, certainly a huge influence. Anybody reading my books can see that, but <clears throat> my style is very different from hers. Um, the characters are different from hers. The uh, plot structures are different from hers. I like to think, I, 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 the, in a sense, I wish that she were alive to comment on my books because if she liked Mickey Spillane's novels, I think that she would really have loved my books. Uh, that's just my opinion. <laughs> we have no way of knowing that, but, but I think Ayn Rand would have loved Bidinato's thrillers because she had that swashbuckling, a love for swashbuckling thrillers and novels and characters. And she loved uh, people was, uh, she, she liked the Mike Hammer character in Mickey Spillane's novel. She liked his moralistic style and that's, she'll get that in these novels. And uh, um, I just wish that there were more people who were doing this sort of thing. We can only preach this stuff so much. We've got to show it, not just tell yeah. it. We've got to, instead of just talking about it, we've got to demonstrate it to people, make it part of our culture, part of our art, part of our narrative arts in film and TV and music and novels. And essentially, I, I switched professions to do that. And that's what I'm doing right now. And um, do you see that as kind of a, a way for, you know, objectivists to just if not becoming fiction writers, but some way to, you know, get forward your own narratives of, of the stories you're trying to tell? Because I think narratives, <clears throat> the fundamental narratives we build in our lives, usually implicitly at a very early age, because I think those really shape who we are and that we generally afterwards as we mature, we gravitate to philosophies that embody those narratives that uh, Ayn Rand saw in her character Cyrus, that I saw in Zorro and the Lone Ranger and Batman, because we gravitate to philosophies that embody our narratives, I think. Um, I would like to see more people producing art, not just talking about these ideas, not just arguing the ideas as ideas, as abstractions, but but trying to manifest them. And I only would recommend that to people who, who <clears throat> you might say have an internal calling to do this kind of work. Um, I don't think that anybody should take on a profession because they think it's the good thing to do, or you're gonna change the world because the world needs changing or something like that. No, it almost becomes a duty. <clears throat> yes, exactly, exactly. It's very intrinsicist, it's very, uh, deontological, and I don't think that is a good way to do it. Um, and I read a lot of fiction from people who were influenced by Rand, and much of it, I won't say all of it by any means, but much of it is wretched because these people are clearly, they are trying to preach objectivism, and their characters are thinly drawn, the plots aren't well thought out, and what I describe, uh, their characters are uh, little more than premises with feet. <laughs> um, they walk around, they show up in scenes in order to deliver their lines of, of, uh, 
of uh, lecture dialogue, and then they move off stage to some other scene where other characters come in to, 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 to preach at the reader. <clears throat> That's not fiction. That's people who are trying to write essays and trying to write um, uh, nonfiction who are moving into the fictional realm because they think either that they should or they, they feel some desire to write, in, write their nonfiction in a more colorful way. I wish they, they would stick to the nonfiction and that those people who feel really inclined as storytellers, that they have stories that they want to tell, they've got characters inside of them that they want to get out, that they want to play God, you might say, with reality and reshape it in their own image and likeness by creating their own worlds. People who are moved in that direction to create art, those are the people who ought to do it, but they ought to do it by looking inside and not to some other mentor character for, for guidance. They need to look inside themselves and say, what do I have to say? What's important to me? What is it that I am trying to manifest in my art, in my fiction? And say that. And you'll find that your premises, if you're really, you know, say an objectivist uh, with objectivist premises, they'll come through anyway. They'll come, they'll come into play and they will shape in very subtle and subconscious ways what you write, what you produce, what you paint. It'll be there. But you just don't have to feel that um, all of this stuff has to be done for the purpose of sending a message. It doesn't. Right. I'd like to um, ask just one more question. I know we've kept you a while, but um, in your novel, you bring up the concept of righteous slaughter. Mm -hmm. And um, if we try to translate that to like the real world and um, enacting justice in a legal system, you think of like the death penalty. Right. And mm -hmm. um, this was an issue for Ayn Rand. And she kind of, when yes. she answered the question in Q&A, she would kind of wobble between a yes or no answer on the question right. of capital punishment. Right. I was wondering... Do you have any insight on the problem of, you know, achieving certainty when you're trying to, to give the death penalty to someone? Cause that's always an issue is like, you can't be certain unless the evidence is like clear cut that the guy killed or murdered somebody. So oh, yeah. Yeah. a death penalty is not justified. How do you approach that problem? And do you have a solution? Well, I don't know about a solution. I, I haven't, I, an opinion on it, like I have an opinion on almost everything in life. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> let me just make a distinction first. I use the term righteous slaughter <clears throat> was something that was uh, applied by another character, I think. And, and he thought that whoever was doing the vigilante killings might be that kind of a person. Um, I picked that up when I talked to FBI profilers and other people during my Reader's Digest days <clears throat> uh, about uh, criminals, particularly serial killers and mass murderers, especially the guys who will walk into a Dunkin' Donuts and mow everybody down because of some problem in their life and they think society's out to get them or they want to blame the rest of the world or a particular kind of people. And they build up in their mind some sort of a rationalization for murder. And so the, the uh, term righteous slaughter has usually been applied to those kinds of mass killers who, who rationalize the slaughter of, of people who, you know, just a wholesale slaughter of people who are innocent or mainly even unknown to them. Dylan is not engaging in any kind of righteous slaughter. He's in, he is doing um, retribution. And that answer, this is, brings into play the answer to your question here about the death penalty. Justice, the only way that I see justice as meaning anything and working is that it has to be, when you're talking about criminal justice, a proportional response a proportional punitive response to the harm that somebody has done to somebody else. 
Now, why do I emphasize the word proportionate? Because let's suppose we have a criminal justice system whose goal is one of several different kinds of things. Let's say it's rehabilitation. Let's say it's um, uh, instead of rehabilitation, it's uh, restitution. Let's say it is, um, well, I, I guess I started out with rehabilitation. How can you get proportionate justice? In other words, a person paying for the level and proportion of harm that they did. How can you do that if your goal is the future outcome for the individual who was the perpetrator? In other words, you're not going to punish the person. You're going to try to change them. Um, or deterrence. There's a very easy way to deter crime. Capital punishment for all crimes. I mean, that'll deter it, but who would call that just? Why wouldn't you call it just? It's not proportionate to the harm that was done. You don't put the death people guilty of jaywalking or you know spitting on the sidewalk or even committing, say, armed robberies where no one is shot and killed. It's disproportionate. The punishment does not fit the crime. Um, to me, justice has to be based on some sort of a premise or principle of proportionality, where the consequences that the person receives are proportionate to the consequences that that person uh, inflicted on somebody else. And when I look at it that way, I say, when you're dealing with, say, Ted Bundy or a serial killer, or you're dealing with somebody who is, you know, does one of these uh, horrible mass killings, or a premeditated murder of an innocent person. When you're dealing with somebody like that, what conceivable punishment is proportionate to the harm that they have done? I look at that question and I say, their victims will never have a life. They have curtailed whatever happiness that they were going to experience in the future. They were, they've, They've harmed countless people who loved their crime victims, the families, the friends. Those people suffer huge losses when, because of their murders. So if you're guilty of first degree premeditated murder of somebody else, of an innocent person, um, what possible conceivable punishment can uh, you justify except the forfeiting of their own life, their own continued existence. They will be, if you even give them life in prison, I've been in prisons. I wrote uh, uh, an article for Reader's Digest about the kind of life that these guys have in prison. And they want to portray it at all as hell holes, but they managed to get all kinds of amenities and perks and experiences that they can continue on their life. Even in a life sentence, they, they experience things that their victims are never going to experience. They are able to continue their lives in one way, shape, manner, or form. Their victims will never do that. I find that fundamentally disproportionate and unjust. So my argument for the death penalty for capital cases of premeditated murder, and I'll make one qualification, in which there are no extenuating circumstances like mental illness, uh, like uh, uh, the person, it was an accident or something like that. If there are no extenuating circumstances that mitigate their culpability, I think that, that the death penalty ought to be on the table as a standard punishment for premeditated murder without those kinds of mitigating circumstances. Now, the one other thing that you ask about is the question, the epistemological question, of how do you know the guy is really guilty? And could the guy have been framed? Could he have been set up? Uh, could the uh, uh, witnesses have lied? All that sort of thing. Yes, I think that the imposition of the death penalty, you'd have to meet a very, very, very high standard of proof. You have to, a standard of evidence that where there no reasonable person 
could possibly doubt the culpability of of the uh, murderer. Let's say, um, yeah, they just released Sirhan, Sir, Sirhan, the guy who killed Robert Kennedy. Right. There was no question who pulled the trigger. He's on TV, you know. There's no question he did it. There's no question it was premeditated. Uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. questions. Uh, who pulled the <laughs> Robert trigger. Kennedy Jr., uh, <laughs> unlike many other members of his family, it, uh, if I can just editorialize, he's a nut job. I mean, if anybody who knows anything about Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and the positions he takes on a lot of issues, he is a very weird duck. But so I don't take his 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 views very seriously. But but Sirhan Sirhan did it in broad daylight. There are other serial killers. I mean, look, you get these guys who um, the, the, uh, the one guy I'm trying to think of, the killer clown who had the, these boys that he murdered and buried oh, in his right. ba- yeah Berkowitz John Wayne Gacy yeah John oh, Wayne Gacy had them buried in under his house in his basement it's a, kind of hard to say he didn't do it you know and uh and they knew somebody escaped and they told exactly how he tried to kill them and all of that when you got somebody like that there is no question he did it there's no question it was premeditated there there I mean it that is all out. He's not being framed. There's, and you look at him. He's a he is a cold blooded, premeditated killer. A, you can label him a psychopath or a sociopath or whatever other things that the um, that the shrinks want to come out with as a label. But the fact is, he knew he could do it. He knew how to avoid capture. He try. He made sure he would avoid capture, as most of these serial killers do. They are not. You know, when people say they have an irresistible impulse, somehow or another, they always manage to resist the impulse when the cops are around. <laughs> somehow they manage to resist the impulse when there are witnesses around. You know, they right. these guys perfectly manage to control their impulses when they are in danger of being captured or discovered. And uh, so as far as a mental disability that's that's forcing them to do that, that's nonsense. And uh uh, so for those kinds of people, I think that where the high bar is met of, of proof, uh, you look, if, there's, if it's a proof enough to put these people away forever, proof enough to uh, punish them in other ways, it ought to be proof enough to put them, uh, put them uh, to death in a death. I mean, you don't have to do it, you know, in any kind of a grotesque way. Um, you know, I think that the business that the, the, using the chemicals uh, to put them, the drug uh, right, to right. put them to sleep and all of that sort of thing. That, I'm perfectly fine with that, but they should not be permitted to continue living when anybody who does that sort of thing. And we, there are always the possibilities that they could get out. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not using a deterrent, a deterrence argument because I think that's a bad argument. <clears throat> but there is that possibility and it happens. Um, I, I saw people attacking a police station last summer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, you, you look at these people and there's always the possibility that they can get out. A governor and a president has a complete unfettered right to commute or pardon. And they could decide, you know, you could get some Quaker, some pacifist president who decides I can't abide by the death penalty. I can't abide by a life in prison. <clears throat> I'm going to show mercy and I'm going to pardon this person. He's yeah, he did all these horrible things, but maybe he's changed. I, I, there is no arguing with that pardoning power. So the only surefire penalty for a first degree murderer premeditated murder is the death penalty. And it's the only punishment that I believe that is proportionate to the harm that is being done, remotely proportionate to the harm that's being, that's been done. So that's my answer. <laughs> well, thank that's you. great. I'm, uh, I'm in general agreement with that as well. Um, Robert, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, your uh, best-selling justice thrillers, Dylan Hunter, the series is available on Amazon. Uh, we, we hope it uh, does get turned into a uh, movie or miniseries right. <laughs> or something. And uh, if that happens, we'll definitely have you back for that. Um, 
just, uh, you know, I just thank you for everything that you're doing and for, you know, in your own way, in your own life with what you're doing, you're, you're helping to uh, still promote Ayn Rand's ideas, even without being officially part of any movement. Right. Well, and, and if people want to find out more about me um, or my books, they can look up my name on uh, <clears throat> online. They can go to um, either hunterthrillers.com. Um, or vigilanteauthor.com or bidonauto.com and it will take them to the same place, which is my website. So hunterthrillers.com is probably the easiest to remember. <clears throat> I'm on Blogspot with a nonfiction blog, uh, bidonauto.blogspot, B-L-O-G-S-P-O-T.com. And uh, they can find me on Facebook at uh, um, Facebook. Uh, slash bit and auto so I'm, I'm at all those places great well, and my books as you say are on amazon so wonderful william any final thoughts <clears throat> uh, just uh thank you very much robert for coming on i really enjoyed talking to you um i and i appreciate your answers to my questions and especially about the death penalty because that's something i've been thinking about and actually trying to write about i'm you a big theme in your novels is the nature of evil as well. And so I look forward to reading the rest of your novels and more about your ideas on um, evil and. and right. uh, well, I hope, I hope that the readers understand or that the, your listeners understand <clears throat> that these books are entertaining, that they're fun reads. They're not preachy. They don't, they're not there to, you know, heavy handedly impose messages. Uh, I think anybody who likes thrillers, um, likes romantic suspense. I think that they will like my Dylan Hunter thrillers um, as just as entertaining fiction. And that's the, that's the first bar that any writer has to hurdle. So that's, that's um, my hope is that they'll check them out and that they'll enjoy them. That's well, you've great. certainly hurdled that bar and the higher bar as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate the opportunity to chat with uh, your listeners. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, again, uh, I'm Scott Schiff along with William Swig. This is the Ayn Rand Fan Club, and we will see you next time.